Okay, so we are going to continue our discussion on viscosity. So just to recap, let's actually go to the, the original discussion on viscosity or introducing viscosity as a property dates back to, back to Newton and 17th century. And essentially, in the most simplest of the situations, if I have two parallel plates and one of them is moving at a steady uh, velocity and the other one is stationary, basically the momentum that molecules in this bottom layer have that is close to the plate that is moving, they have a much more momentum, which is basically mass times velocity in the x direction. And because of the molecular collisions, they're going to transfer that momentum in the upward direction, basically in the direction where, where there is less of it. Okay? So in this case, our stationary plate is in the y direction on top. So I'm going to have transfer of the x momentum in y direction. This is why we refer to this as tau yx when I basically, uh, tau yx, which is the uh, x momentum transfer in uh, or flux of x momentum in y direction okay. and that flux is inversely proportional to the distance it has to travel okay. it is proportional to the actual velocity or the size of the velocity that is getting transferred and there's a coefficient of proportionality in there that we're uh, interpreting as mu or viscosity now, again, this is a law, so this is not something that is absolutely true, but it's simply, it was, Newton came up based on observations. And then you start proving it, right? <laughs> and you start evaluating in which situations this is actually true and for which fluids, right? and in which, uh, where are the limitations of it. So our momentum view so there is a force and momentum perspective. So momentum perspective is basically x momentum of particles is transferred in positive y direction per unit area. And that area is, of course, perpendicular to this y direction. Okay. And there is a force view where I can also look at it if I kind of imagine, imagine that I have two portions of fluid or at any point I draw a plane, then below me there's this lesser y portion of the fluid in the lower um, y uh, coordinates. And that portion has more velocity in x direction. And therefore, it's exerting a shear force onto the portion above. Okay. And basically, I can look at that that's a force in x direction exerted by this box, essentially, of fluid on that box of fluid. Okay. And also, I look at it for unit area and per unit time, okay? So I also have resistance perspective, and this Newton's law is just like a lot of other laws where I have flux that is proportional in the simplest of the relationships, a linear relationship, to this driving force or the gradient of the potential. So I can also, I also have Fourier's law, which is heat flux, and that, yeah, in that case, I'm looking at the gradient of temperature, okay? and coefficient of proportionality is thermal conductivity, and I have the, basically the similarities between these types of transport, and I could also add mass to this, uh, mass transfer to this uh, table as well. There's also Hooke's law, and there's similarities there. I also have shear stress, which is the magnitude on the shear modulus here is typically 10 to the 9, meaning that we don't really observe a lot of <laughs> deformation. Deformations are really small in the case of solids, but it's still the similar type of law. Fick's law is what governs essentially diffusion or mass transport. Again, I have in this case gradient of concentration. Uh, it could be speaking of coffee. It could be if you put some sugar bottom of your coffee cup, then you're going to have a concentration difference, right? The only problem is that, that the diffusion has to fight gravity, so unless you help it with a spoon, nothing was going to happen. 
And this goes back to my original, uh, original point that you can now know all of the derivations of mass transport you'd like if you don't observe that gravity is the, <laughs> the, 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 the dominant uh, in this case, that actually the fusion doesn't get to act much. So all of your derivations and calculations don't mean much, right? So you have to always decide what is the dominant transport first, and then employ the, the appropriate thing. So essentially, we have the similar law. And in this case, this coefficient of proportionality we call diffusivity. Okay. Darcy's law, again, similar family of laws. And Ohm's law, I can also look at the transport of electrical current. Okay. So there is different versions. So the original version is that basically there is a flux okay, that has proportional. The conductivity is the constant. Uh, and then I have the difference in potential. Though we often look at the integrated form of this law, where I'm calling this conductivity times area over the uh, difference in distance is 1 over resistivity. And this is this resistance view that I mentioned that we could also apply here. Okay? So when I integrate it, I get my Ohm's law as we are typically used to it. Right? Voltage is current times resistance. OK. So let's look at the units. Okay. In SI system, uh, viscosity has the units of shear stress, which is Pascal, divided by the units of derivative of velocity. So that's meter per second times 1 over meter. And that gives me Pascal second. Or also, you will often see Newton over meter squared times second. Okay. So that is SI units, not always the most common one. It's quite common, especially in the United States, to refer to poise and centipoise. Pretty much because one centipoise is viscosity of water. So it kind of it's easy to remember, right? So it can normalize uh, pretty much. So then I have dean over uh, centimeter square. So this is CGS system. And then I'm just looking at the centimeter over uh, second times 1 over centimeter. And this is what boys is. So essentially, since 1 Newton is 10 to the fine, uh, 5 uh, dean, then I get that 1 poise is 0.1 Pascal second. And most often, we're going to deal with centipoise. So that's 10 to, the, um, 10 to the minus 3 Pascal second. So centipoise is 10 to the 3. Uh, minus 3 Pascal second. That is viscosity of water, so that is typically what we relate things to, water being the most common of all fluids we have to deal with. Okay. This is again, I have to stop myself, but it's really easy to click through PowerPoints. <laughs> so if I don't stop, you stop me, okay. wave at me, just don't throw anything at me. But <laughs> Dr. P. Yes. Uh, just a question on one of the previous slides about the lesser greater portion. This has to do with the shear flow that you showed us. It, this one? Yeah. So it, it, it's just like a convention. In, in which sense? Uh, sure, it is a convention, but it, what, what do you mean? Um, I, I guess one thing I don't understand is what, why is the lesser side called that when the force is... So we know what's positive, what's negative. Okay, so, so it's a convention. Yeah. Okay. So it's always a convention. Coordinate systems are always a convention. Okay. They're here to confuse you. Okay. <laughs> and the most confusing part is typically the one that whatever flux happens, it happens in the direction from greater to smaller. Mm. Okay? And every coordinate system I know points from smaller to greater. Right, right. Okay. So every positive, positive vectors, they point from smaller values to. So they're always going to be positive vectors that always kind of point counter the value. Okay. Now, you also have spatial distribution of whatever property you have at hand. It has nothing to do, doesn't know about the coordinate system. It doesn't care to be oriented with the coordinate system. We often try to orient our little world with the coordinate system. but 
pressure itself doesn't care what the coordinate system is. It's you know higher in a certain area and smaller in a certain other. And how does that relate to the coordinate system doesn't matter. So that's something. So yes, this is in order to get what's positive, what's negative. Coordinate system can they can be quite confusing. Um, in viscosity, typically it's the same convention when you look at the shear stresses. However, when you look at the stress tensor in mechanics, solid mechanics, the geomechanics, people who work in subsurface, and linear elasticity people who work above surface, if you will, uh, have two different conventions in what's going to be positive, what's going to be negative. Kind of personally drives me nuts a little. Uh, and the reason is that convention is do you want to call extension positive or compression? Those are two different directions. People in geo world and subsurface, they live in compression. Every, all of the stresses below 100 meters approximately are compressive, period. Right? So you don't want to constantly deal with negative numbers. But linear elasticity came along sooner, before geomechanics. Right? And they have a convention that extension is positive. So, Think about that when you're working in software <laughs> and you look at the positive versus negative. Um, it might interpreting whether that you know, extension or compression uh, might depend on like you knowing which system you're in or just evaluating the situation. So yes, unfortunately, conventions are just that. They're uh, agreements. None of them is in itself correct or not correct. They just are. So quick quiz, true or false, viscosity of liquids decreases with temperature. True. Yeah. true. Viscosity of liquids decreases with temperature. Okay. So now we know that from our kitchen experience when we heat up the oil. How about gases? False. Must be false because it must be different. This <laughs> 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 is just a guess. Like what a guess. It depends. Huh? It depends. It depends. It's, it's mostly false, okay? But we would like to know, so this is, again, these are observations we make. Okay? And one would like to be able to explain these observations. So this is the experimental observation. And actually, remember how I to told you that you find the software that you like plotting things in? So. For me at the time, this was MATLAB, so I literally took the values from table 112 in your book and plotted them, and you get something like this. Tables never tell you anything. <laughs> I always had to put a graph of something versus something else to actually see what's in there. So tables are kind of useless often, other than just looking up a specific value. So when you put the information for air for different temperatures, into the graph, you will see that viscosity actually increases with temperature, which is, for liquids, from the same table, I grab water, and I see that viscosity decreases as I go towards boiling point. <coughs> so cool, we can always do a lot of measurements, and we do. This is what part of the scientific effort is. And there are tables of these <coughs> properties available. But one would also like to know, well, why is this? Why is, th why is this happening? Okay. So we will actually proceed to, right now, chapter 1.4. I'm going to come back to chapter 1.2. So your reading is 1.1, which is just the introduction to viscosity that I just did. And now I'm going to jump to explaining the molecular basis for viscosity. And then we're going to go back to generalizing things into three dimensions and to get the tensor out, okay? So I posted both of these slides on Canvas. So has everybody oriented themselves around Canvas? If you're new to it, you know where to find things. Um, I don't know if you looked at my YouTube 
channel. This is what I was joking about when you couldn't see that. You can see that a, a mother of three-year-old has a combination of Richard Feynman and Thomas the Train, all right? Not to mention Masha and Medved. Everybody knows Masha and the Bear? Yeah. Hilarious. I love being named after such a character. <laughs> like she's an engineer, an artist, whatever needs to be. Uh, if you haven't seen Masha and the Bear cartoon, uh, see it. It's actually, it's really good. <laughs> so, Masha is this most industrious <laughs> character that could ever be. Uh, so I love being, having the name. All right, so I have a playlist that is for PG381M Fall 2018. So this is where I'll be posting movies. I'm not going to email you every time I do. Okay, just go there and find it. You can Google me. That I'm the only Masha Prodanovich around there. I can post the link to this. But I'll just... Now, email me if I didn't post something and you need it. Okay, then to speed me up. Other than that, um, so this is the playlist. But you can... Uh, so right now we have only two. Okay. okay. Uh, but you can also look at the previous years if you'd like. Um, the material is similar. Okay. Now here and there, uh, most of them are complete. Here and there, there was a, an issue, and for some reason I couldn't record. But other than that, they're relatively complete. Okay. So the materials are there. Again, I'm not going to fill up your inbox unnecessarily. Just go there too view if you need to. If you don't need to, that's fine too. All right, so this is uh, where things are on YouTube and then Canvas, just in a standard location, I have a lectures folder where you can find PDFs of these things. All right, so this ends our 2.1 lecture and I'm going to go to the molecular basis. And woohoo, we have the same, I don't know, I didn't do anything, but now this is projecting fine, and it's fine over here. But this one is the one that got the... <laughs> so because I have this hooked on, that solved the problem from yesterday. <laughs> All, right. All right, so we're moving on to uh, our molecular basis for viscosity. And today we're going to look into molecular basis for viscosity of gases. Uh, so again, just a reminder... Our motivation for finding some theory to, so that we can actually... Theory means when you have a good theory, then you typically have a formula that gives you viscosity of gas, this and this gas, and this and this temperature, and that. Okay? That's what means having a good theory behind something. So that would basically explain, and then you can also then poke around that relationship that you get from theory and you can see and learn from it. So we would like theory or theories that would give us explanation for uh, this increase versus decrease uh, of viscosity with temperature. So what are we going to do? We're going to have the following approach. We're going to assume pure gas at low density that is in between two parallel plates. So this is our standard, I'm going to call that Newton's law situation. Okay, this is what Newton considered. And we're going to impose gradient in velocity. That means that I have a different velocity here than here. So we're going to do a standard thing where I have a constant velocity Vx here and zero up there. And then we're going to use kinetic theory formulas. And kinetic theory gives a lot of statistical formulas that are derived for gases at low density. Okay? Uh, and that essentially assumes very simple relationships. Molecules are simply balls that have elastic collisions. That's it. There is no other intermolecular force. So we're going to, after using that kinetic theory, we're going to see, well, what do we get that flux of momentum is given this gradient of velocity? Okay. Let's try. Sounds simple enough. Okay. So this is my Newton's law of viscosity. Again, I'm imposing a constant velocity below. Now, kinetic theory has the following assumptions. And kinetic theory is nice because you get a lot of formulas that gives you for velocity of the gas at certain temperature and so forth. So 
each molecule is a rigid, non-attractive ball. And those gas balls or molecules are in constant random motion. And I only when they interact, I have elastic collisions, meaning that I don't lose any momentum in this collision. Okay? So whatever comes in, comes out. Now, distances between molecules are rather large, and there is enough, still I have enough molecules in this box to be able to apply statistical formulas, so I have enough statistics. Statistics you cannot do when you have, you know, three molecules in the box. <laughs> so we got to do a little more. So this is the setup, and I'm going to switch to writing in a moment. So basically, we're going to apply gradient, okay? So this is at some position y. I'm going to have, this is my velocity at y minus distance a. This is my velocity at y, the velocity at y plus a. And I'm going to put my gas on a grid, <laughs> okay? So I have my molecules. And kinetic theory gives following results that we're going to use. First one is number density. I have a formula for number density of molecules per unit volume. Uh, or rather formulas that are using that number density. Then if I have that number density, which is literally number of molecules per unit volume, and diameter of the molecule, I will have the following expression for mean free path between two collisions. Okay. So this is how long I'm going to travel okay, between two collisions. So I, if I'm a molecule, I go here, I collide into this one, I go the other way. And then in between these, and then I have another collision. In between these two collisions, I, on average, have distance lambda. Now, this is just distance in space. It's not necessarily, I'm not necessarily aligned with any coordinate system. And I have this random motion, so everybody's moving in all directions. If I look at that distance as projected at one of the coordinate planes, approximately, or on average, I'm going to see two-thirds of lambda, okay? So this, on average, these collisions or, this, or, or vectors between two locations of the two last collisions, on average, when I project them, I'm going to see two-thirds of lambda. And again, so again, my A, or this distance, is two-thirds lambda, and lambda is given. Next thing that I, next result that I'm going to use is the average speed. So for randomly oriented velocities, they're oriented in all directions, but their magnitude is related to temperature. We know that, right? So basically, this is Boltzmann constant times temperature that gives me the kinetic energy of the molecule moving around. Okay? And this is the mass of the molecule, A and B. Okay? And finally, what I also need is frequency of molecular bombardment on one side of the surface. So for momentum transfer, I have to kind of cross that plane in y direction, right? So I'm going to have to figure out well, how many times, how, how frequent are the crossing. Okay? Now, and when I say on one side, it's basically, if I look at the, all of the molecules in this box, okay, what is the frequency of them colliding into this hand of mine? Or rather, not hand of mine, but we like things with coordinate systems. Okay. So a little plate. And I'm just going to look at the at it per unit area. Of course, it's always good to normalize. And I have a formula for that as well. It's 1 over 4 and u. And one or two of these formulas you're going to actually get to derive. It's a little bit of, it's an integration exercise for given distributions of properties. Um, and you can actually arrive at these formulas assuming this randomized uh, velocities in all kinds of directions could distribution, statistical dis distribution. Okay. So it's actually not that difficult to derive. All right. So we're going to remember the flux business in a moment. This is where we're going to switch to writing. This is the molecular. Oh, oh wow, this is sensitive. This 
This is what happens if you touch with your hand by mistake. Opa, I have to figure out how not to. Touch by my hand, but actually, it should. It's probably some property of this. Uh, why don't you use undo functions? Undo? I don't know, you are erasing stuff. So. Oh. so now it's going to undo erasing. Oh. That's not a good thing. All right, so there is somewhere on this that it shouldn't be sensitive to my hand touching. Uh, but I'm going to now not spend five minutes looking for it. So, molecular basis. Oh, viscosity. Four gases. So what is the situation uh, that we have here? We're going to look at that coordinate system. Okay. And I'm going to look, this is my y direction. So this is going to be my, oh, this is not going to. Is this something to do with this? Okay. So I'm looking at this plane at my level y, okay? So if I look at the molecule that is at this position, okay? if I'm wondering, this molecule has either arrived from below or from above, okay? So it could possibly could have come from here or here. What do I know? So I'm wondering what momentum does this molecule have? If it has arrived from below, okay, I know that this distance is approximately lambda, right? So this is approximately lambda. And so is this. Wow. This is way too sensitive for me to... Everything is... So this is lambda as well. But if I'm looking in the coordinate system, okay, what is the height? If I came from above, what is the height of it? It's, okay. it's y plus a, right? So if I came from here, right, this is my y plus a. Or if I came from below, I came from y on average, right? This is statistical. Okay. So therefore, if I arrive at this plane, and I arrive from below, I'm carrying momentum from my last collision that has happened at plane y minus a. So my momentum is, on average, my mass times velocity from position y minus a. If I came from above, my velocity at my last collision was, on average, this velocity at y plus a. Cool. So now we actually have to relate this to flux. Or what we are actually interested in is flux. Tau y x. In my flux perspective, so here is where that flux perspective is useful. Okay. Whenever I'm dealing with molecules, typically flux will be it. So my flux of momentum perspective says, well, this is the flux of x momentum across this plane that is positioned at y. So 
It's essentially sum of the x momenta of all of the molecules that have came from below, okay, minus some of the molecules went in the op opposite direction. This is the randomized movement. Movement. Even though I impose the gradient, that doesn't mean that nobody is going opposite of that gradient that is imposed from the outside. It's the world of molecules. It's just the majority will go in the upward direction. So basically, this is x momenta of molecules. Okay that move in plus y direction, okay, so upwards, minus x momenta of molecules that move in minus y. Great. Now I just need to figure out what that is using those formulas that I had. Okay. First, so what is the momentum of one of them coming from below? Vx evaluated at y minus a. Yes? So those are the ones that are coming from below. But I don't have one of them. How many of them are crossing that plane? I have that frequency of bombardment per area. Great. I need per area for my shear stress anyway. So it's just going to be Z. And Z, just to remind you, it was on the slides, was 1 over 4 and U. Very average velocity U. I also have a formula for it. And N is the number density per volume. Cool. And then minus, what is the momentum of the molecules coming from the top? Z, M, cool. So that is Z times M times. Now I have Vx at Y minus A minus Vx at y plus a. Now I'm going to use the most useful the uh, theorem from your calculus class. If you forget everything from calculus one, don't forget Taylor's formula. Always. Okay. So when I'm evaluating a value of a function in, a in some neighborhood, okay, at a point that is close to this point, it's, I have f of x, if you remember, is f of x0 plus f prime of x0, x minus x0, plus all those other terms. And whenever you're doing anything, you're going to just ignore all those other terms. Because <laughs> the, the first order approximation does it. All right. So then I use this here. But, so this is, and I'm assuming I have enough, I'm doing statistical mechanics here. So I have enough molecules that I can assume that this velocity, when I look at it statistically, it's continuous. Okay even though I'm kind of looking at the molecules, but I do have enough of them. So I can assume that this is a continuous function that I can do and that it has a derivative, right? So that I can do or, or apply this formula to. So this is going to be Vx at y minus a times derivative of Vx in y direction. Right? And this is going to be similar just with a plus. So the actual value of Vx at y will cancel. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to be left with is minus okay, Zm2 times a dvx dy. And this is, again, approximated. 
So I use only first order term from Taylor. And in every calculation where you actually want to calculate something, you're not going to go to the second term. Anyway, okay. it gives you a quadratic term and then good luck. Okay. All right, so now I just really throw in all of the values. So I have dvx dy, okay? And I have expression for A and and it doesn't want me to undo. How's that? I have an expression for A. And I have an expression for Z. Okay. So A is two thirds lambda. And my lambda was 1 over square root of 2 p d square m. And my z was 1 over 4 n average velocity. And average velocity is square root of a kappa t over c m. So I can work that out. And basically, I'm going to get, without even working that out, let's just look at it first. I have that tau yx is minus something. That something depends on temperature, mass, number density, diameter. That's it. Okay. So there are properties of the molecule, diameter and mass, and there are ambient properties, that is the temperature, that really tells me it's correlated with how, uh, how fast molecules move. So it depends on the gas slash ambient properties only. Yes? Um, so if A is two-thirds lambda, can we assume most molecules move at the same angle? Yeah. Okay. Statistically, they do. Okay. 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 So it's the statistical average. And that's what you're looking for. So on average, they do. That, that all of them are in randomized motion, so not all of them do. But when you average it, you get that. So I have something that multiplies dvx dy. So I have that something has to be then viscosity, right? Or when I compare it to Newton's law, I see that it's in the place of viscosity. I did not assume viscosity here. It jumped out of me. Okay? Assuming this first order approximation here, okay? So I didn't go to the higher order, but to the first order approximation for the velocity here, I got that my tau yx is indeed theoretically minus a constant that depends only on gas and on temperature. The type of molecule I have, the little ball that I assume that it's diameter and mass and temperature, times dvx dy. Okay. So we, are, we came from the molecule perspective and arrived at that. But that's what Newton observed here in this room, no molecules. Okay. So you basically converge from two sides, you arrive at the same. This is the power of going both experimentally and theoretically, and for finding both theoretical experiments. Right? So this is when you think you understand things. This is still very simplified. We can assume that our molecules are little tennis balls. They're not. There's Van der Waals forces. There's all kinds of forces within molecules. So I know now that for simple gases, it's going to work. Okay, if I have nitrogen. 
cool, right? But for something more complex, okay, some bigger molecules that definitely I cannot start ignoring intermolecular, uh, the more polar the molecule is, the worse I'll be because I actually have strong intermolecular forces. If I have high density, so all those molecules are nearby, it's not going to work, right? But in the simple case, we actually have the confirmation from the theoretical perspective of something that Newton in 17th century, okay? Newton didn't do statistical mechanics in 17th century. Okay? He just looked at it all. So this is the power of having the theoretical explanation. So again, this is my mu. Okay. And it depends on M, D, and T. Okay. The rest are constants. Mm -hmm. How do we know that the number of molecules in the top and bottom are both equal and equal to zero? In a statistical sense, they are. So this is equilibrium. Oh, yes. okay. So here's a okay, good catch. This is, we're assuming equilibrium, okay. even though you're imposing gradient in velocity, therefore it's a non-equilibrium situation. But you will all, always, in theoretical discussions, you're always going to do that. You're going to kind of freeze for a moment. It's kind of quasi-static. And that, so you're, because that's the only formula you have. So it's again an approximation. But, and I'm assuming that whatever imbalance, Whatever imbalance in the number of molecules or whatever really comes from momentum. Okay. So imbalance is in the momentum, not necessarily in the number of molecules. Right? Because I don't actually have transfer of molecules overall in bulk. So there is no bulk velocity in my direction. Right? That doesn't mean that some of the molecules don't cross. They do. But overall, I don't have the bulk movement of the fluid in y direction. Only momentum. Okay. So there's this power of the momentum transfer. The matter is actually moving in x direction, right? Okay. So, so only imbalance that I actually have is in their momentum, not the number. And also this a equals 2 by p lambda, is that an assumption too? Or do we know that? It's again, it's a, from statistical mechanics to think about it. Okay, cool. So let me just actually write down what this mu is. So mu, ah, really? I think you can just press that. There is a icon at the upper side. You can see. I'm glad that you had the time. Yeah, it's a red one. Thank you. Um, the last time I used this software was like two years ago. So you can see. Um, and then things change, of course. And then I'm like, oh, no, there are things. Even if I had some memory of where things were. And again, I know that there is, there is somewhere where I can uh, adjust the sensitivity to my hand. Because this is for artists, so you, I could actually do like artistic stuff with this, which I never do. I just write formulas. So that's also part of it. If I was a little more artistic, I would know what to do with it. Um, so my mu, but I'm not more artistic, and I'm an engineering for that reason. Okay, so this is two thirds p square root p m kappa t divided by p d square. Okay. So, did I explain anything? Yes. I've counted the Boltzmann constant. Right? Yes. Boltzmann 1.38 times 10 to the 23. <laughs> Joule per second. Okay. I have notes. I have those notes somewhere. Yes. 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. Joule per Kelvin. So, kappa is Boltzmann. All right, did I confirm 
I started wanting to explain experimental observation that viscosity of gas increases with the temperature. Did I confirm that? What type of dependence did I get? Square root of t. I don't know that graph is kind of linear, but so I'm not completely explaining, but I'm on the right path. Maybe. <laughs> I can convince myself, okay? Right. So, again, we did indeed see that viscosity increases with temperature. Good. Okay. We're going to improve this estimate a little more next time, and then we're going to continue with the viscosity of liquids, another theory. So, next week, you're off. Okay. So we don't have, well, you're off on Monday because it's Labor Day, and then there's two times we're not going to have this morning class. We're going to have another makeup class on Thursday, 13th, at the same time as yesterday. Okay. Cool? All right. Well, enjoy your next week, and I see you Monday the 10th.